Dear friends, although I was very eager to write to you about the salvation we share, I felt compelled to write and urge you to contend for the faith that was once all entrusted to God's holy people. And once again, welcome to another episode of Standing Firm, Defenders of Faith. I am one of your hosts, Candace Paul, author of Spiritual Warfare, and I am with my co-host, Mr. David Chandler, author of several books, and um, we'll let him give an introduction about his work and things later on. Um, but this topic is very fitting for today because we are actually going to talk about spiritual warfare. We're going to talk about what it means, how it's present in today's society, and how people are literally battling with these type of things. And my focus on this conversation is more of the practical, real world evidence of it. And I'm going to rely on David to really give you kind of the foundational biblical type of things in terms of spiritual warfare to watch out for, because he's very knowledgeable on that. So let's just get right into it. What does all of this mean, David? What do you think? Well, scripturally, it means that uh, we it, it kind of denotes the how late the the, the days are and, and how well how late the hour is. Hmm. And um we we hear of things that and as a matter of fact Jesus Christ gave us an indication of what the times would be like during the the the, uh, the end of the church age before his return. And uh we have Matthew chapter twenty four uh, and then we have uh, other passages of scripture that uh, tell us. But in terms of spiritual warfare, uh, we have Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. And it says that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. Well, actually, the weapons of our warfare, uh, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, I'm sorry, but against principalities, against powers. And against uh, spiritual wickedness uh, and the rules of this world, and so again, Paul is talking about a specific kingdom that is rallying against the Christian Church, and so again, you know, you, you hear of spiritual warfare, and right away you talk about Frank Peretti and all of these others, but. From a biblical standpoint, you know, spiritual warfare is just that. It's, it's basically something that we as believers have to really, really consider. And we, we cannot neglect the fact, we cannot negate the fact that uh, our warfare is spiritual. Our, our war is, uh, we're fighting against a spiritual kingdom, and that's the kingdom of Satan. Satan said that. You know, Jesus said that um, Satan's kingdom is 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 unified, and uh, a kingdom is cannot stand. A kingdom is well. The, the thing is, is that we are constantly uh, in a in a war, and, and Paul even said that the good that I would do, I would not, because evil is present. So that talks about a constant war not just within our not just within ourselves but without Mm -hmm. and um but again i'm going to go back to ephesians chapter six where it talks about well the weapons of our warfare for the weapons of our warfare are not uh 
but we wrestle not against print, uh, flesh and blood. So that that's key there. We we don't wrestle against each other. We're not wrestling against our next door neighbor, but we're wrestling against those forces that motivate our neighbor, especially if they're not saved. Mm. So again, uh, we and then another thing we have to note is those um, uh, things that we're wrestling against. And um, again, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities. Well, those principalities, a principality is a high ranking demon. Mm. And then it says powers, you know, powers meaning uh, those spiritual forces. And then it says, Spiritual wickedness, uh, you know, the, the rulers of this world, the rulers of this world are guided by these forces. And then it says spiritual wickedness in high places. So that means that these entities are in, uh, the, the second heaven. Their, their, uh, their kingdom is located in the second heaven. Um. And, and so, uh, I'm going to turn to Job chapter one. I, I don't know if the hope this answers some of uh, the their, uh, your questions. If anyone is listening, um, Job chapter one and well, Job chapter one says that um, God is a very special conversation that God, uh, God is having with the devil and, and God says well where have you been and he says I've been walking up and down the earth mm. and so that you know that that's basically and, and I'll I'll read the verse to you right here um, it says that uh, all right you know, verse six. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. And the Lord said unto Satan, When comest thou? And then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. Mm. So, so is this something that the devil is doing supernaturally? He's teleporting from one place to another in the earth. Or he's just carousing the earth, looking for new victims. Hmm. And that kind of gives you an indication, a clear indication, that our war is spiritual. And also, in Ephesians chapter 6, we're going to go to the same chapter, but we're going to go a few verses above. It's. Uh, I guess I'll start with... with Verse 12, well, verse 11, actually. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may stand against the wiles of the devil. Now, the wiles of the devil are his, his schemes, his tactics. Mm -hmm. You look at the military. GT is in the military. Uh, they prepare him or they've prepared him for uh, enemy tactics, whether it's guerrilla warfare, whether it's biological warfare or whatever the case may be. But, of course... Our language has been modernized within the past, I could say, about 50 years. So we don't necessarily say wiles. We'll say tactics or schemes. But the Old Testament language, well, the, the old language or old English that the Bible uses, or the King James Version anyway, uses the word wiles. And it just basically means tactics or schemes. But we have to put on the whole armor of God. Paul is telling the Christian well, put on the whole armor of God that you may stare, stand against these schemes, these tactics. Mm. And then it goes further down and it says, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against the rules of darkness of this world, against spirits of wickedness in high places. I already explained what that is. And it's a spiritual hierarchy, a spiritual hierarchy where the devil uh, has a kingdom of, in, in this particular world. Yeah. And this is what we're, we're, we're fighting against. As a matter of fact, this is exactly what your book is about. 
your book is about a spiritual warfare. As a matter of fact, that's the title of the novel. And these in, these entities are in the, in the world. And notice, I want you to pay close attention to the word world. Against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world. Now, the world, the way, the word world is using this, the same Greek word, aeon, which means age. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2 verses, uh, I'm sorry, first, 2 Corinthians 4 verse 4, we, we, we read, Paul is talking about the same thing, uh, for in whom the God of this world, aeon, meaning age, have blinded the minds of those that believe not. So, again, it's the same text. It's the same, well, not the same text, but it's the same Greek word, aeon, the, whom the God of this world have blinded the minds of those that believe not. Yep. And that it's translated age. It's the same God, Satan. And so we, we're, we're looking at it here in verse uh in chapter 6 verse 12 against the rulers of the darkness of this world the rulers of the darkness of this age this present age and against uh, and of course against spiritual weakness in the high places and now, now notice verse 13 wherefore take unto you the whole armor of god that ye may be able to stand withstand in the evil day and having done all the stand stand yeah so that's spiritual warfare and and thank you for providing all of that context because it's very important. And I definitely want your insight onto some of these real world examples of how spiritual warfare is playing out today. Uh, you know, I've always said if you kind of take a step back and just look around, you'll start to see what's going on. Um, I think we rely a lot on what we can see, touch, hear, you know, and those type of things, what we can sense with our five senses. But a lot of times it's hard for us to really believe or even wrap our minds around the fact that there could be a concerted effort to take us off course for us to be harmed or hurt and that someone could be behind it turning the wheels and wanting this to happen desiring this to happen to us i think it's hard for people to truly wrap their minds around it but the thing is if you take a step back and just kind of look at how things are going you'll start to see things clearly and what i mean by that is this Sometimes it seems like nothing could ever get done. You have to ask yourself it, if the point actually is for it not to be done. If no one can come to a consensus, if there's always strife, if there's always something going on where it seems like no one could, could reach a, a conclusion where it's for the benefit of everyone, maybe the goal is for it not to be reached. And what I mean by this is I have a, a very real example. While the world has been watching or maybe not paying attention or being distracted, somehow 1% of the world's population controls about 82% of the world's wealth. Okay. Somehow, and, and I've said this before, if people have heard me speak on this, Somehow, about a third of the food that we make for human consumption goes to waste. <clears throat> about an eighth of people on Earth don't get enough to eat on a daily basis. The rates of suicide has gone up in every demographic. There's a study that's been done on that. Every group, every age group, every racial demographic, suicide has gone up. The rate of depression has increased. If we just keep looking at the numbers, you'll start to see. And I just saw a study the other day that said loneliness has increased 
among people. And you have to ask yourself, why? Why is this happening? So what are your thoughts? Well, it's happening because uh, people are looking for something to hold on to and something tangible, something that they can touch Mm -hmm. with their own five senses. Yep. And what I've noticed, and I've pretty much noticed the same thing that you've noticed in the world, we're seeing more crime. We're seeing more murders, rapes. Uh, we, we're seeing more violence as the violence starts. And it seems like the warmer it gets, the more violent people become and the more out of control people get. And I've, I've noticed that you find in the book of, and I'm going to, there's an, I'm going to turn to the scriptures once again. And, uh, it, we're, first I'm going to start with first Timothy chapter four, and it's going to begin at verse one. Now the spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to, to, uh, to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Now, I'm going to go back. I'm going to go forward to uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3. This know also that in the last days perilous or dangerous times shall come. And I'm, I want you to pay close attention to verse 2. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. Verse 3, and this is part and parcel of what you just said. Without natural affection mm-hmm. now th- this can be determined and i want to stay on uh on script as far as the bible is concerned concerning this uh passage here especially with verse three without natural affection now you, you see people that don't care they that the love of many shall wax cold is what jesus said and we're witnessing that. We're witnessing it in, in the world in particular. 30, 40, 50 years ago, we didn't have this problem. It was very rare for us to see murder, 41 murders in one weekend. Mm. It was very rare for us. And the only reason why that was is because during the 50s and the 60s, People were together. There was a, there was such a thing as community. People stuck together and if there was someone without enough to eat, whether it was a family or one individual, then that person from that community would pitch in and help that person get something to eat. That, that person would be helped with all of the necessities, all of the, whether it was miscellaneous or whether it was something that, uh, that there was a, if there was a need, it, it was provided. And now, well, go ahead. No, and and make sure that you remember your point. But um, and now I'm just speaking to what you said. People are becoming more desensitized to stuff, and it, people care less. Like you were saying, people literally are caring less. But it's because people are becoming more desensitized. You can see so many horrific things on Facebook. You can see so many horrific things on the internet, on television, and it's just there. It's constantly there. Um, you, whether it be the news or whether it be, um, a fictitious event that someone created from their head and now they're showing you on television, still you see extreme violence day in and day out to everyone. You hear about it. And on a certain level that desensitizes people, it makes people become apathetic or believe that there's very little that they can even do to stop it or they can, they can't really affect change. And And, and that's, and and that's the reason why you, you have Facebook and Twitter and Instagram uh, and, and, and I'm going to give you a couple of examples to back up to what you just said. Uh, you have more of an influx of single mothers posting their, posting themselves disciplining their children while well, abusing their children. I saw one Facebook live uh, video, 
and uh, with, uh, depicting this mother saying all kinds of things to her child. Now, her child was it couldn't have been no older older than maybe thirteen or fourteen, and of course, her child was special needs, developmentally challenged, mm-hmm. and. The mother was saying all calm. I mean, the the things that this woman was saying was, I can't repeat. It was just vile and disgusting. Mm -hmm. There was no empathy. There was no uh, love. There there was just, it was just so heartless. And no one seems to care. No one seems to stick out or just stick their hand out to this, this young girl that's suffering at the hands of this abuse. And then there was another instance where this father posted beating this young girl that was, you know, she found, you know, he just, the father was found two girls that were twerking, and this was a while ago. And um, he took a switch and beat both of them and put it on Facebook. And and that's very, and like you said, there will be a lack of natural affection. And those are mothers to their children, fathers to their children. We haven't even talked about uh, the incidents of strangers fighting each other, just seeing brutal fights among teenagers or just horrific things all around Facebook. And it's just like, where is this going? And we, we get so used to it. But these are really traumatic things that people are witnessing on a daily basis and it, you just scroll in your news feed and someone will put something up there and you don't even have time to react it's like wow this is this is just there so you know and these are small things that we're talking about but it speaks to a larger issue because these are just this is just passive observation but what about the people who are actually engaging in a lot of these activities? And they're a lot more extreme. I was listening to a Vice News special. No, it wasn't Vice News. It was another uh, kind of an independent news special where this guy, he goes around and he goes and he does a lot of investigative journalism. And he goes to a lot of harsh and dangerous areas to bring news to people, to bring it to light. So he was in, I believe it was India, and they were talking about sex trafficking. So he ended up finding this gentleman who was well known in the community as a sex trafficker. And he sat down and he interviewed him. And the man, he had his his sunglasses on, he had his head, he had his cap on and his head tilted downward as he spoke to him. And so he says you're a sex trafficker. And he's like, yes, I am. And he was very proud of that fact. And he's like, how many women and girls have you trafficked? And he said, you know, basically thousands. And so he, he asked him, do you let them go at a certain point? And he said, no, I killed them. And he was taken back. He was like, wait, what? You killed him? He's like, yes, I killed him. And so he said, how many girls have you killed? And he said, about 400. Hmm. And so the everyone was shocked when they heard heard that number, his crew. And he was like, wait, what? Are, and he had to ask, are you just saying this just to say it? Are you just saying it because you think it's cool to get a rise out of me? And he's like, no, I, I've killed about 400 girls. And he said it just matter of fact, like it wasn't a problem, like it's just an everyday thing. And he had to literally stop the interview because he was so disgusted by this man who literally seemed heartless and didn't care. Uh, But there's other stories like this. Uh, You know, I saw another story where a guy was a drug trafficker and he talked about kidnapping people and holding them for ransom and torturing them. And he, he even admitted to the fact that he knows that he won't get any peace. He's never fully happy anymore. He's, he can only reach about 70% happiness 
and he knows what's going to happen to him, but he doesn't really care. So this is where we are now. We're, we're at this point where people behave like this. They don't care about their fellow man at all. Literally, they can kill someone, they can hurt someone, and they don't care. Well, it's because of the uh, lack of remorse. And again, uh, where did all this stuff come from? Where does this lack, this, this extreme, this blatant lack of empathy and sympathy for other people come from? Well, it comes from the entertainment industry. And I'm pretty sure some of us, you know, some people that are listening or will be listening to this broadcast are going to say, well, how can you blame that on the music industry? How can you blame that on television? You know, it's just television. It's fiction. Well, I'm pretty sure you've heard of the old expression, life imitates art. And mm-hmm. w- w- when you look at television within the past 60 years, I'm not going to go any further than that. I could, but time is not going to permit me to do so. Let's go back 60 years. I- I'd-, I'd say about maybe 1960s. The advent of color television, the advent of um, the do what thou wilt philosophy really gripped American culture. Mm. And uh, I'm going to go, I'm going to mention something. I'm going to mention an organization known as the, as the Hayes, um, well, as the motion picture of America, the most, the motion picture of America was started by a man named Ted Bear. I, I, I think he was a Christian film artist, uh, a film director or film producer. Mm-hmm. And, you know, he, uh, well, actually it was called the, um, yeah, the Motion Picture of America that started in, 19, in 1926, I believe. And it was a Christian organization that took control over Hollywood and all the script writers and the the script writers were informed that they could not have any actors uh, make fun of religion or anything of that sort. And all the way through them, and and it lasted about maybe 40 years after that. So I'd say that those things started to wane after around 1950-ish. And in around 1960s, then you started seeing a lot of actors push the envelope a little bit more. And it wasn't until 1966 where the church left Hollywood. Church just left. And mm. in came the Church of Satan. Guys like uh, Kenneth Anger. Uh, as a matter of fact, Anton LaVey, who was a lion tamer, started the Church of Satan in 1966. He wrote the book, he, the, the Satanic Bible, and got it published in 1969. And during that time, uh, the very first occultic, well, not the very first, but one of the first occultic movies that was produced during those time, during that time or during that year was a movie by the name of Rosemary's Baby. Hmm. It was, it starred Mia F- uh, Farrow as the woman that gave birth to Damien. And, of course, the, the plot of this, the movie was that Damien, this child, was supposed to be the son of the Antichrist, or the Antichrist. And Satan had impregnated her, and she gave birth, and so all of this other stuff. And it was written, well, well it wasn't written, but it was, the, the, the person that depicted Satan was Anton LaVey himself. Wow. And, and so, and then you have shows like Invocation of My Demon Brother, Lucifer Rising, and then the, the subtitle was Invocation of My Demon Brother, which was re- which was directed by Kenneth Anger. Kenneth Anger was a a Satanist. He was a film director, and he worked alongside the Rolling Stones and other and and other uh, uh, rock stars. But he was an independent film director. And all of these shows, and then you go into the 70s, show uh, movies like uh, The Exorcist uh, and depicting Satan as this all-powerful being. You could never be stopped. And then in the 80s, you have your influx of slasher films, Friday the 13th, 
Halloween, um, Nightmare on Elm Street, uh, Chucky, uh, or a Child's Play, I'm sorry. Uh, Child's Play was a movie that was depicted a serial killer that died, who was executed, and in his soul in, possessed this body of a doll. And so he came back as this doll going around killing people. Hmm. So you so, so you have all of these movies depicting evil as all powerful, can't be stopped. And then it was a couple of other show, movies in the seventies that I remember. One movie was called uh, the Trilogy of Terror, which um, starred Karen Black. I don't know if you remember her; you're probably too young. But mm-hmm. K- Karen Black was this woman that bought this doll from this occult. Uh, store bought it home and then it ends up coming to life and then just tried to kill her and then at the end of the movie she ends up killing the doll but she ends up becoming the doll itself and and these messages it, it you know and it, the point that you just made was very very important it was a very important one um the fact that they depict evil is all powerful and can't be stopped can't be controlled and we're powerless against it when the truth is it's the exact opposite especially when you know who god is and you know who can protect you in fact they're they can't do much of anything (laughs) you know but this builds up a fear and that fear makes you think that you can't fight against it when you actually can uh you just have to remember who you are and who you are in christ so it can be intimidating but that's where we kind of have to put on the armor and and that's what the bible talks about so well yeah um the bible does talk about as, as i read earlier in the show put on the full armor of god the whole armor, mm-hmm. the breastplate of righteousness, the helmet of salvation, um, the, uh, you know, and, and so forth and so on. But uh, back to my original thought, it was called the Hayes Code or the Hayes Commission, and it was set in the industry to uh, guide, you know, or moral guidelines that were applied to most United States motion pictures, and it was – around from 1930 to 1968 that's about i'd say about 30 years 30 or 40 years Mm -hmm. and then during the the 50s we saw a decline of the moral values that the shows that these movies used to have before then you know when marilyn monroe came along uh jane mansfield jane mansfield was a member of was a high priestess in the church of satan and so how we we saw all of these people in all of the, and then, you know, the, the during the sixties and the seventies, we saw more and more. And, I, and again, I'll reiterate, we saw more and more of the lackness or the, the laxness of the, or the, the morals were a little bit more lax. And then in the seventies and the eighties, we saw everything just explode right before our eyes. And as children, I remember seeing cartoons that were overtly occultic overtly occultic i remember seeing shows that made fun of men that were in positions of leadership made them look stupid and incompetent and the women were the ones that were the decision makers well wait a minute that's not in the original but that's what the in 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 during the 90s it got worse yeah it got worse and so we were seeing more violence in uh a lot of your movies and how many murders have I seen? How many murders have anyone has uh, seen during the, the, uh, during the last 30 years on television, people being killed, people being hacked to death, people getting their heads chopped off. And the more we saw it, the more our conscience were, uh, started becoming, you know, seared with a hot iron and we became more and more apathetic. And so now when we see a fight break out in the middle of, I don't know, Broad Street or something like that, you'll see a group of young people take out their cell phones and record it, start yeah. laughing. Instead of call for help, 
and would rather pull out their cell phones and record it. And it's, it's very frustrating because it's almost like people think that this is happening for no reason. And it just happens. And no, it doesn't just happen. It is happening for a very clear reason, a very clear reason. And that's what I talk about in the book. As you know, spiritual warfare, it's a fictitious uh, depiction of what spiritual warfare means. Uh, And it follows a few characters and it shows you through their life and their experience what they have to grapple with, this unseen world. And it becomes very real in the book, what the unseen world is. And um, yeah, so, so that's what I talk about in the book. And if you all have an opportunity, make sure that you follow the link and you check it out for yourself and tell me what you think. But getting back to the topic of the show, what can people do in order to safeguard and protect themselves from this practically? What would you say, David? Well, I would say that uh, we have to be mindful of what we watch on television. We have to be mindful of what we listen to. Uh, we have to be mindful of even the friends that we hang with or we associate ourselves with. Uh, the, the Bible is clear on that. Uh, <clears throat> be not deceived. Good, um, bad morals corrupt good character. And um, we we need to understand that, uh, as the Bible tells us, you know, we we cannot take these things lightly. We we cannot afford to take these things lightly because our spiritual uh, well being hangs in the balance. Mm-hmm. Um, I can remember not having any Christian friends uh, earlier in, in 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 my life, and uh, you, you know you, you can only imagine what that's like being in no man's land. You, you know you. you church is not really sure who you are and then you you turn around and then you have the world and you say well okay well I don't want to get too go straight too far away into the world because I may not be able to come back or I may get messed up or damaged on the way back yeah and and so uh we we have to and then parents parents please be mindful If, if you're a parent if you're a listener you're a parent you have children uh Always monitor what your children are looking at. Always Mm -hmm. monitor what your children are reading. Always monitor who your children are hanging out with or associating themselves with. Yes. You know, ask questions. You know, don't interrogate your children, obviously, but ask questions. Yeah, just just be involved, you know? Yeah, yeah, be involved, be discerning. Sit your, your, your child down, your teenager down, and I'm talking more specifically about teenagers, Children are just as important, but teenagers more in in particular, because teenagers now are at that um, age in their development where they're able to think. They're able to think for themselves, and they're able to decipher what they're looking at. Well, if they're looking at evil, then they're looking at evil. They're, Mm -hmm. They're looking at the occult and all of these other things. Sit down and talk with them and tell them the difference between good and evil, and good always wins according to what the Bible says. It's not what they're depicting on television because Hollywood has is, is just a, a mirage. It's not real. It, it's not mm-hmm. real, even though the powers that guide them are. But they're, it, it's, it's not real. And these actors are being used by those powers that we just got finished talking about earlier in the, uh, the, the, the show. Exactly. And do you think all of them know they're being used or do you think some of them are just as much in the dark as a lot of other people? Are you referring to the actors? Yes. Well, I believe they do to some extent. Uh, I, I think that some of them have totally given themselves over to the dark side and others, you know, they're being used, but they don't know where to turn. And 
some of them have broken away from their occultic programming, like DMX. Uh, Bill Cosby tried to break away, but look where he is now. Um, mm. if you look at, um, Britney Spears, you haven't heard anything from her since her breakdown on television. And, <laughs> and this stuff is so deep because you don't know. You just really need to pay attention to what people are involved in, what people say and what they do and be mindful. Just like you said, be mindful of who you hang around, what you listen to, what you watch, because it is very real. I I have a a confession to make, and I'm going to say this in the recording. I'm a writer. I'm an author. Uh, I've written about, 10 book, well, nine actually. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm sorry, eight. And the ninth one is a short story, but, uh, and I know the, the, the subject matter of all of my novels depict individuals with superpowers, mm-hmm. you know, comic, you know, superheroes, even though I don't depict them as superheroes, like, you know, the, as the common, uh, comic book vernacular would suggest, but, you know, and I, I am careful about how I depict these characters, mm. uh, especially the bad guys, like the, the bad guys that are on the wrong side of the law or whatever the case may be. I, I am careful about how I depict them. Yeah, they have some strange powers and they can do a lot of things, but I don't make them gods. I don't make them so powerful that they can't be stopped. Mm. Even if it looks like they can't, they, they're unstoppable, they're not. And we have to really be careful of the message that we give to children because children are not abstract thinkers. They don't, they, they look at something and then they try to act it out or they believe it because, okay, this is, you know, concrete thinking is the fact that whatever I see, I believe. Yeah. As opposed to abstract thinking suggests, well, you know, good and evil, you know, you're not going to get a, a philosophical conversation out of a 10 year old or a five year old like you would with a 15 or a 16 year old. That's why it's so important to reach the children while they're young. Parents, please, I, I beg of you, I implore you, this is imperative. Talk to your children. Mm. I don't care how you know, you know, oh, she's too young. Forget that. Sit them down and talk with them. Yeah, you have to dumb down your conversation. Well, not dumb down, but you have to talk to them in a language that yeah. they can understand. Make it because, age appropriate. Yeah. Right. Make it age appropriate. You know, you don't talk to a five year old like you would talk to a 30 year old, obviously, but just talk with them because the devil is out here. He's real. He's a real life person. And he's, he's, he's out there trying to kill, steal, and destroy. That's his primary objective. But Jesus said, I have come that ye may have life and have it more abundantly. So we have to keep that in mind. We have to, uh, really, really, uh, consult the scriptures if we don't know. Exactly. And the, the last point that I'll, I'll leave everyone with is, what a pastor told me one day, he's a pastor now. His name is Pastor Mo. Really good guy. Um, gonna have to try and get him on the show one day, but I remember him giving this analogy and it always kind of stuck with me. Uh, he was talking to a group of us when we were volunteering at this, uh, this youth kind of after school program. And he was sitting down like a couple of kids gathered around and was asking him questions. And he was always good for, you know, breaking things down at a level that everyone could understand. So he was sitting at the front desk and there was a swivel chair and he was talking about the devil and he was explaining how the devil twists things. He used Uh real life things that, all of us are used to and comfortable with, but he twisted in a way that will put you in danger, will guarantee to put you in danger. 
And so what he did was he was talking to us and all of a sudden he decides to sit on the back of the, the swivel chair. So he put his, he placed his behind where you would put your back and he placed his feet on the seat of the chair. And so everyone's like, oh my gosh, Pastor Mo, you're going to fall. You're going to fall. And he, and he was like, oh, I'm going to fall. He's like, but this is what happened. And he was careful to balance himself. So he didn't fall, but he was explaining a point. He was like, this is what happens. The devil will tell you that this is how you're supposed to sit in the chair. He'll tell you you're supposed to sit with your butt on the back of the chair and put your feet in the seat and not place your feet on solid ground. And he said that that is a, anything can literally make me fall right now. If one of you came up to me and pushed me, I will fall to the ground and be hurt. But this is what the devil does. And he uses a thing that we're all used to and comfortable with. And we feel like we know and understand. And he will convince you that this is the right way to sit on this chair. But this is the guaranteed way to hurt yourself. And everyone kind of took a step back and was like, wow, wow, I didn't even think about it like that. But that's true. And if and we're not going to get into all the details of this now, but if people just take a take some time to just think about what in the real world right now might be a swivel chair that you are sitting on incorrectly. What might the world have told you make sense to do? make sense to be, make sense to act like, or behave like, or do, or see, or watch. And it doesn't make any sense, and it will harm you. How many of those things can we see today? And we're not going to fill in the blanks for you. We're going to let you think about it yourself. What might the world or society has told you make sense? And it just does not. So something to think about so leave it in the comments let us know what um you have identified as something that doesn't make sense but the world is trying to make you think that it makes sense so i'd love to hear what you have identified so once again david thank you for your insight and sharing your thoughts and your knowledge and your information and for everyone who's listening Make sure that you like and subscribe to this channel so you can be the first to get all the latest information and join the discussion. We want to hear from you. Uh, leave a comment, uh, send us a message, and just continue to stay informed and engaged. Thank you guys for all your support, and until next time. <laughs>